Uh, today, I want to get into, um, you know, one of the big topics the last couple of years, and that's really going to focus on some insect updates. And I want to start things off by uh, getting into grasshoppers, of course, especially uh, in the north central and in the western part of the state. Uh, this has really dominated the headlines over the last couple of years. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in extreme detail for this life cycle due to time, but a few of the main points I want to call out. One, uh, the overwintering part of the life cycle uh, for cropland species, many of them overwinter in eggs and begin to hatch as we get through the warm time uh, of the early part of spring. As you can see here in our life cycle, of course, we're working through May and June and this part of the life cycle. You can already see this icon, Scout Now. Well, there's two main parts of the life cycle uh, that we really want to think about scouting. And you know, one is early in the season, crops are just beginning to emerge. Secondly, for many of our crops, we're reaching the reproductive stages as we work through the uh, mid latter part of July and into early August. So these are two areas that we want to think about scouting as being very important in our IPM 12 box. When I think about the last two years, however, we really, populations have just been so high that you really just don't want to scout early and late. You actually needed to keep that scouting much throughout the growing season. So that is of extreme importance these last couple of years. And I've seen some um, suggestions of scouting two to three times a week during this period of high populations. If I come down here, you know, what is often the best time to think about controlling? Usually we talk about the nymph instars. Uh, you can see second to third instars, really just differences in sizes. Um, this is kind of the best time to think about control. Now, a lot of times, well, in all cases, the wings are not fully developed and means they're not functional. So we have an increased chance of chemicals coming in contact uh, with those specific uh, insects and having a more extreme impact. Of course, by the time we're in the adult stage, we've really reached that time period at which uh, wings are fully developed and usable, uh, and that can help lower the chances of contact coming with the insecticide. When people ask me about grasshoppers, what should I be thinking about going into 2023? Well, the first thing I'm going to ask all of you guys is to consider what did you observe late in the season last year? And when I think about canola, I think about that being more of an early maturing crop compared to some of them. Uh, you see some of them here, sunflower, corn, soybeans, and you can see some of the impacts that they've had. So why am I thinking about the late maturing crops from last year? Well, of course, canola coming off the fields earlier in the season means those grasshopper populations have to move elsewhere. So where are they moving? They're moving to those late maturing crops that are still green because they still have a, a big appetite that they want to fill. So these are some of the crops that they move into. And as that happens, these become the likelihood areas of where egg laying has an increased chance of happening. So as we work through winter and now the early part of spring, as temperatures begin to warm, this is going to be the focal point to think about. These are the lands that will probably have an increased area of egg density from the following year. So it's always something to think about as you reflect back on the history from a year ago and what type of population you might see as we move into 2023. The weather can be quite impactful um, and it can have an influence on both uh, decrease or increases in temperature. You know, warm springs can allow premature hatch to happen, but a cold snap might slow development. A hot period in the spring, again, early hatching, but if you have a cool, moderate temperature summer, that can favor the occurrence of disease in grasshopper populations, again, driving down some of those populations. Finally, a cool summer, delay of maturity, and in the fall, that really shortens the time period at which eggs can be laid at a given field site. The problem of the last couple of years, especially really in the north central and the western part of North Dakota, we didn't see any of those. And that's why we've seen such explosive populations, especially along that Montana border, where some of those populations are so extreme. Uh, some growers have been resulting to four or five chemical applications for control. What increases population? Some of the weather we've seen the last few years are a perfect example. Cool wet weather in the early spring delays hatch, 
but it also provides moisture to other host plants, whether that's in roadside ditches, uh, other crops that are growing in the area, even beyond canola. Uh, it allows adequate food supply to grow, so populations can continue to expand. Warm and dry in the late spring, again, pr pr promotes uniform hatching, as well as good weather conditions. Hot summer adequate ro uh, rainfall. Well, the heat helps keep some of that evaporation underway, so it does not necessarily favor disease development, but that rainfall promotes more growth to some of the plant hosts that they may feed on. And finally, a late fall tends to expand egg laying, which means a higher population could be possible in the following season. I know many of you have seen this chart come up many times throughout many extension uh, talks throughout the year, but I have to focus on the threatening uh, action threshold. You can see uh, uh, what that threshold is, this highlighted in gray. These are the thresholds at which to consider chemical evaluations in a given site if needed. Of course, numbers reduced for adults, they have a more voracious appetite and can feed more in a shorter period of time. Also, you see a little bit higher numbers at the field margins because there's other hosts in the area. So they may not just have a direct impact just on your crop right at that field margin uh, because of those other hosts being present. So always keep this population in mind um, when you're evaluating and doing those scouting performances throughout the year. Also important, think about what natural enemies are present. And it's not just other insect predators like blister beetles that we've talked about so much throughout the year. This can include other wildlife such as birds, uh, snakes, lizards, and other wildlife in the area. I know one common idea that's come up to me is the fungus, the summits disease. You see an example of that there. It climbs to the top of the plant and dies there. It can be impactful, but not on years of drought. A lot of times you need moisture for a fungus to succeed, and we just haven't had that the last few years. Uh, so always keep that in mind. I wanted to touch on the grasshoppers, but I also need to touch on a relatively new pest in canola country. Uh, that's going to be canola flower midge. So, of course, canola flower midge, relatively new, discovered in North Dakota the last couple of years. Um, and then we have that the sweet midge. It's one we've been keeping an eye out for that hasn't quite yet surfaced. Uh, oftentimes, when we think of midge, we think of wheat midge, and we know it's the larval stage that causes damage. The same is true here. The adults are just kind of a sign that they're present and scouting needs to occur. When I think about the host plants, we know canola, canola flower midge does target canola. Does it have other hosts here in North Dakota? It's so new, we don't fully have a complete understanding of that yet. So that's a question mark. A uh, sweet midge uh, been found in parts of New England area, of course, parts of Canada. We know members of the uh, Brassica family are the main targets and that includes canola as well. People often ask me, how can I differentiate the two? Well, they're both about two millimeters long. They're both kind of a light brown color. So those really don't help us. A lot of times you have to rely on genetic testing. Uh, one physical attribute might be dense hairs found on the wings of the canola flower midge. Again, the one found here in uh, North Dakota. Compared to the one yet to be found here, more transparent or clear wings. Uh, but overall, the best thing is to reach out to your extension personnel in the area and have us come be part of the conversation so we can look forward to uh, getting proper identification underway to help better think about what type of control might be needed. If we focus just on canola flower midge now, the one present, what type of damage does it have? Well, the larvae injure the flowers and overall it results in a swelling that prevents it from opening. As a result of that, those flowers are essentially are aborted and we really don't get to see the pod or the seeds come to full development as a result. And that has a major impact as you look further down the line. If you think about 2021, uh, I haven't got the 2022 map yet. If you look at this, um, these are the locations of trap sites throughout the area. And for the most part, they've hugged the Canadian border across the northern part of the state. Uh, state. Pardon me. Some of the bigger areas, you know, Towner County, just under 300 being found, Cavalier County, just over 100, as well as Botno County. Uh, these are not huge populations, but we know they're present and uh, more studies will come down the line as populations continue to grow. So what does that mean for us looking forward? Well, monitoring is going to continue. Uh, you might begin to see more pheromone trapping of these adults. 
uh, one of the big questions has been planting dates. And what we've noticed is early planted canola really results in more damaged pods. With that being said, they also still have a stronger yield return. And that's really due to other agronomic practices around in those field sites. So uh, we still have a little bit more of information to learn. Uh, insecticide seed treatments, of course, we're talking about flowering stages. Most seed treatments last about 35 days, so we're well beyond that. So we don't really have a true impact from them. Uh, this particular pest has been found in Canada since about 2014. Yield studies already underway there. We hope to turn that direction here uh, in the coming years as populations build, but we're going to enjoy the small populations while we can. Uh, really not that impactful. I do want to thank uh, the Northern uh, Canola Growers Association for some of the funding here. They've been a big help in letting us do studies with both uh, flea beetles and canola flower midge. And with that being said, I'm going to turn this over to Anitha to talk about canola flea beetles. All right. Uh, thanks, DJ. Uh, I'm Anita Chimomila. I'm the Extension Cropping System Specialist at the Langdon Research Extension Center. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, canola flea beetles and uh, the results of a study, efficacy study of insecticide seed treatments on these beetles. Yeah, as we all know, there are two common uh, flea beetle species that we encounter in canola. Um, the one is the crucifer flea beetle, which is the common one or the dominant one which we find. It emerges a little later in the season, uh, but it is relatively easy to control. The striped flea beetle, that is the Philotreta striolata, which is the naughty one, uh, it, it is a less abundant species uh, for now, but uh, we need to keep an eye on this species because it's increasing in numbers. And it uh, emerges relatively uh, uh, early than the crucifers, about uh, one to three weeks in season. And I say it is naughty because it is a little tough to control because it's been showing tolerance to neonic uh, seed treatments. And a little background about these flea beetles is uh, this is, these are the most serious uh, early season insect pests in canola causing significant damage to canola seedlings, and that is from the stage of the cotyledons to the four leaf stage. And coming to the control cause, uh, it, the <clears throat> annual costs of controlling this insect are nearly uh, uh, 300 million dollars only in North America. And we have been relying heavily on the seed treatments as our primary mode of control. And majority of the seed uh, in uh, United States uh, um, that we use will be have been treated with uh, uh, seed treatments. And because uh, for the past 10 to 15 years, we have been relying heavily on these uh, neonic uh, uh, seed treatments, it has led to the resistance issues. And the Canadian researchers have already shown that the striped flea beetles are showing more tolerance to uh, neonics than the crucifer flea beetles. So let's see what the what the seed treatment options or the insecticides are available for us uh, in, in canola. So we have three main groups of insecticides. The first one is uh, neonicotinoids, that is group 4A. And then the relatively newer group is the diamides, which is group 28. And uh, the newest group is the butanolites, which is group 4D. How do they function? Uh, so the, first, the two groups, the neonics and the butanolites, which are 4A and 4D, they act on the central nervous system of the insect, causing a quick knockdown effect and the death paralysis and death of the insect. They act in different pathways. However, they act on the central nervous system of the insect. Whereas the other group, that is the diamides, which is uh, uh, group 28, they act on the muscle fibers of the insect, uh, causing irreversible muscle contraction and uh, cause the feeding cessation in the insect. So this is a relatively uh, slow acting in a chemical, uh, but eventually it will lead to the paralysis and death of the insect. 
So <clears throat> the two major questions that have been uh, asked by growers and consultants and agronomists over years is like, do seed treatments actually work? Uh, and even if they work, are they worth the, um, the cost? So to determine this, uh, um, Dr. Jan Conodal and uh, uh, Patrick Bose in Fargo, they are then our extension entomologists uh, that conducted a field trial in Fargo determining the efficacy of the uh, seed treatment insecticides that are available to uh, use in canola. And here you can see uh, the, treat, the, the tr different treatments that have been uh, tested. And we can see the, the first two treatments are the single active ingredient neonicotinoids. And then uh, they were tested along with the uh, uh, premixes of neonic and the two uh, other groups of chemicals, um, whether butanolide or um, uh, diamide. And these uh, treatments, uh, the premix treatments had been tested at a commercial standard um, rates and higher rates than the um, available uh, standard rates. So let's see, uh, one thing I need to mention is like all these treatments have been sprayed with bifenthrin at a higher rate of bifenthrins 12 days after emergence, because I will explain why they had to be treated with uh, a foliar application uh, in my later slides. And here you can see, <clears throat> So when the study was conducted uh, in year 2022, the percentage of the uh, flea, the composition of the flea beetles was 60% striped flea beetles, which are the naughty ones, and uh, the 40% was the crucifer flea beetles. And the rating, feeding injury rating was assessed at four, seven, and 11 days after emergence at the uh, rating scale of zero to six, where zero is no pits or no damage, and six is like, uh, Plant, uh, the plant is dead. So uh, this is a busy slide. This is the results of that study. And you can see all the treatments on the x-axis where the extreme right one is our check where the seed is treated with the fungicide only. And you have the, um, let me bring my uh, laser pointer here. Uh, the the two treatments next to on the left uh, to the control are the neonix alone and the rest uh, of the six treatments are the premixes so here you can and the the bars the blue orange and the gray bars represent the um, injury at uh, four days after emergence and uh, seven days and 11 days after emergence. And you can see how uh, the, uh, the different uh, premixes are, are very efficient in reducing the injury ratings at uh, four days and a little bit better and, uh, and a little bit even at seven days after emergence. But notice that after 11 days, all the treatments were uh, going down they were not providing any uh, uh, any uh, protection so the you can see the uh, the yield bar that is hanging on the top of the uh, bars here let's see okay how do, how did we do uh, in terms of yield well in the premixes uh, definitely there was a 590 pound yield advantage of using premixes when and uh, compared to the control but uh, neonix also did uh, uh, well uh, then with, without a treatment so it's almost like a 290 pound yield advantage uh, than not using any seed treatment so Let's see how it translates in terms of uh, um, dollars. Um, definitely using a seed treatments, uh, any kind of seed treatments, just a neonic alone gave a $69 net gain uh, than not treating the seed. And when we used premixes, the yield, the net gains were almost double, that is like $150. And the net gain was like about $81.40 over using neonics alone. 
Um, so the time, uh, considering the time, I would summarize my study like uh, definitely we need to use the seed treatments as our primary defense uh, to uh, manage these flea beetles. And when you're considering the seed treatments, always uh, go for the newer mode of insecticide treatments because we have been uh, seeing that they are more effective uh, against both the species, crucifer and striped flea beetles in the field. And when you have high population or repeated infestations of the flea beetles, um, we recommend using the foliar insecticides uh, treatments because we know that the uh, residual life of seed treatments is very short and uh, it is not enough to protect the um, uh, seed canola seedlings all the way. So if you have high infestations, please use the um, foliar uh, rescue applications. So with that, I would like to thank the Northern Canola Growers Association and the chemical companies who sponsored this uh, study. And thank you. Thank you.